Good morning, good morning. Oh, look out. I'm going the windy way today because it's a lovely day. So I've decided to, uh, you know, I prefer the windy way. How are you? Oh, it's tractor time. Are they coming? Are they coming? No. That's where they come out of. Yeah, so. It's whatever day it's on the front of the video. Let's try and sort out the uh, contrast a bit because uh, as usual on a bright day poor day for filming but never mind so hello to Captain Bitcoin if you're watching apparently he does watch these things God knows why I mean I'm the only one who watches them when I'm editing them so, I've got an early start, 8.15 start today, so, but I'm bang on time. I'm getting a bit better about um, going in on time. That was the surgery, which was a bit like a plane. You imagine a plane with four engines, all of which have failed, but it's also on fire and trailing smoke. <laughs> zooming down towards the ground and then just at the last minute like 50 feet above the ground pulling into a level flight and then the pilot fixing one engine and then the stewardess is somewhat damping down the fire and then the pilot miraculously manages to fix a second engine and the plane then starts climbing although there's still mountains ahead and the, and the stewardess is uh, pretty well got the fire under control. That's my surgery. <laughs> That's my surgery. That's it. We're just uh, we're, we're still flying. We're still flying. We're still in the air. That's the main thing. Every day I drive to work and I think to myself, we're still in the air. <laughs> so how's it going? I hope your surgery is going better than mine. It might not be, I don't know. But if it isn't, don't worry. It'll all work out in the end. It all comes good in the end. Providing you trust to market forces. Don't trust to uh, government forces, government action, or government inaction. Thank you. You don't have to say thank you, but I do sometimes. When they sort of think about going round, then she then she decided not to, didn't she? So, hello, I've got someone who thinks he's uh, brought his gym to work. Canterbury Bicycle Club. Yeah, thank you. Get yourself on a velodrome. Get off the roads. Well, that was a bit rude, wasn't it? I shouldn't have done that. I do apologise to my younger viewers. Not that I've got any. Anyway. I mean, I used to ride a bicycle a lot. You know, I used to... I was a very keen cyclist. I went on a sponsored bike ride from uh, Surrey to uh, Cheddar Gorge and back. For Shelter, the charity. And, uh, you know, in those days, there wasn't all this uh, snowflake-type protectionism. Uh, if a car touched you, you got a bit annoyed. But cars used to zoom past, and providing they didn't actually physically make contact, uh, we didn't used to worry about it, you know? Anyway, so yeah, so uh, we've got a receptionist who uh, initially we only uh, asked to come in in the morning, but we've now asked her to come in a couple of days in the afternoon as well. That's because um, 
First of all, she's a good receptionist. I mean, you know, she's really proved to be really, really good. Uh, by which I mean she's she only needs, for the most part, to be shown how to do something once, and uh, she she's very quick to uh, take up efficiencies that you suggest. So, like for example, um, she didn't know about Control X, Control C, and Control V on the keyboard, and we do a lot of copying and pasting and. Uh, cutting and moving about and stuff like that it's just anyone who works on a computer does and um, and so you know and she was doing this right click copy right click paste uh, type thing which is just not as efficient you can you, you can use both hands you know uh, in in parallel so I said to her you know you've got to use control C I said I don't want to see you doing right click uh, right click copy I want you just to be pressing with your other hand control C and then move the mouse to where you want the thing and then control V paste and uh, I think I had to tell her twice because one, one, once you tell them and they, they're like yeah okay yeah alright and then but then the second time you say to them look I don't you know I, I employ both of your hands I employ your left hand as well as your right hand so I want to see it doing something and then they sort of realise that you're you're, you know, it's something that is, you would like to see them change how they do their job slightly, just very slightly, in order to make them more efficient. And it does make people more efficient to know stuff, shortcuts like that. And so, uh, and also it's skilling her up, you know, that's the main thing. She's getting skills, isn't she, with a Z? And that's what it's all about these days. It's not about qualifications, boys and girls. It's about skills. And I'd far rather take on someone, let's say, who can uh, solve a quadratic equation than someone who's got O-level maths. Or someone who can, uh, you know, knows what a pivot sheet is in Excel, I'd rather than having a, a computer O-level. I employ people for their skills. And the more skills you can get, and I don't care, you know, get, get any, get all the skills. You know, if someone offers to show you how to tie balloon animals, then learn how to tie balloon animals. Someone offers to show you how to sharpen a chainsaw, learn how to sharpen a chainsaw. Get that. If you was to write a CV, if I was to write my CV, right, if I was to write my CV, it would be about 100 pages long. Because I would list all my skills. And I've got a ton of skills. I've got, I can tie balloon animals. I can sharpen a chainsaw, you know. I can, I do know how to treat poison ivy. I've got, i got tons of skills. Uh, you know, and you get to that point, don't you, where you're overqualified and, uh, and people look and they think, why would Einstein and Galileo roll together want to drive a bus? And the answer is because I haven't driven a bus and therefore it's a skill I would like to pick up, you know. You know, I can assault. If you said to me, Derek, uh, somehow we've been transported back to the year 1420 and the French are holed up in Dover Castle and we need to lead uh, an expeditionary force to assault Dover Castle and flush out the French, I would have a few really good ideas. And that's because assaulting medieval castles is a skill I've got, i picked up. You know, not expecting to use it really, but <laughs> until they invent time travel. But, you know, the thing is that there's a lot of cross-pollination. You can, sometimes the skill that you need to assault a medieval castle is the same sort of skill you need to uh, uh, assault the General Dental Council or the Department of Health. You know, and certainly chess, I think, is uh, chess and computer programming. I would say were two skills that I've actually used the most. Chess, because it's um, it's a simply a battle of uh, intellect. It's, it's simply a, a contest of who can think quickest and uh, retain, you know, information in the memory. Um, to, to consider all the variations 
and uh, obviously, hello, Junction of Death has got traffic lights on it. I wonder how long that's going to be like that. Oh, what's happening? What's happening? They've got the road closed off the, to the left. Yeah, so, so, and the other thing about chess is that everything's in plain sight. You know, there are no hidden cards uh, or uh, your opponent's position is there. It's right in front of you. You can see, apart from literally turning the board round and looking at it from their point of view, you can see uh, what they can see. So if they beat you, they can't say, you can't say, oh, you, uh, you were lucky. Uh, you can't say, uh, oh, you uh, you drew a good card, or... Uh... Oh, no. It's just two people have decided to put up some traffic lights for a laugh. You know, and that's why, why... I think that's why a lot of people don't like playing chess so much. It's because it is like, it's a straightforward battle of brain versus brain, and and if you get beaten, it's because the other person is, has demonstrated that they can think a bit quicker than you can. And that's a bit crushing, you know? It's a bit... Uh, uh, your only um, consolation, if you're like a middling player at chess, which I am very middling, um, is that... Uh, you know, you can say, well, I'm, I'm better than some people. I'm better than some people. Uh, but even that's not much of a consolation because you end up thinking I'm better than some people who haven't really applied themselves much to chess or studied much um, and therefore would probably be better than me if they if they really tried. So I'm probably worse than them anyway, you know. But I do like chess as a, an art form. I like to watch a chess game. I think that's why it's exploded so much online. Um, because if, if you can follow it it's it's the closest you can get to taking the top of someone's head and literally watching the relays click as they as they think uh, and it can be and it can be you know it is a beautiful game when it, and an exciting game when it's played by people who are both clever or uh, uh, aggressive in terms of their attacking. So chess I think is good because basically it sort of teaches you that sometimes you've got nowhere to hide and that most of the time your enemy's position is entirely transparent to you, you know. Um, it's not always the case. I mean, there are certainly in uh, in the dental when I've sort of looked to try and lobby on behalf of dentistry and de dental profession you, you can find that uh, you're fighting an invisible enemy you know, there's someone, there's some faceless, nameless person behind the scenes who's saying no, this is not it's not going to happen this way and one example was uh, when we asked uh, Department of Health that we could be recognised as an association uh, that uh, represented dentists, which we painfully were. I mean, we, we were a trade union uh, recognised by uh, as a trade union that represented dentists. So we said to the Department of Health, why can't we be recognised as, as a dental association that represents dentists? And the answer came back, I think, from Rosie Winston. Uh, you know, the department is not minded to accept you at the moment as, a, as, a, as an association and in with the letter from Rosie Winterton was a note from the Chief Dental Officer Ram and Betty and uh, Ram and Betty said that uh, it's the opinion of the Chief Dental Officer that uh, nothing, nothing would be served by recognition of the GDPA, the DPA and that note shouldn't have been included in the letter, it was a mistake someone had left it in there by mistake and um, they were mortified when we showed it to them. And, but it shed a light on exactly how these decisions are reached. And 
what obviously happens is that the Secretary of State or Minister for Health, usually the Secretary of State is, is slightly below the... Uh, no, I think the Secretary of State's the top. The Ministers are below. Ro Rosie Winterton was a, a nurse, knew nothing about dentistry. And she got this letter saying, could, could they recognise us as a dental association? That, that we were a trade union for dentists, etc. On the face of it, quite a reasonable request. So what she done is she thought, I'll just run this by the chief dental officer. So she's asked the chief dental officer. Now, Ram and Betty was, was a funny guy. I think he was, if I remember, he was the first Muslim member of the Synod of the Church of England or something. He, he has some funny qualification like that. It was something to do with the Church of England. And... Um, uh, and obviously, uh, big, big BDA supporter, and basically said, you know, uh, no, uh, not a good idea. Now, what he should have said was, not a good idea for the BDA. <laughs> you know, the BDA quite likes being a monopolistic uh, representative and uh, sole, sole representative of dentists, and therefore we would rather appreciate it if you didn't enter into discussions with any other body. But he, he just wrote back and said, no, I don't recommend it. And so, of course, Rosie Winston had then sort of more or less mirrored his language and said, no, we're not, we're not minded to recognise you at this time. But really, it wasn't her that had made the decision. It was Ram and Betty. And uh, so Ram and Betty, of course, was mortified and called us to a meeting at Richmond House straight away and said, look, how can we, uh, how can we put this right? How can we make this up to you? Uh, because I think the minister had... Uh, had said, had given him, had told him what had happened, and uh, everyone had been very highly embarrassed because their uh, the, the BDA's involvement, indirect involvement, in my opinion, had come to light. Because uh, the BDA always provides the chief dental officers; they, they always uh, come from the BDA. And uh, and so we said, well, you know, we want we want membership of a few of the committees that run the association. And and Raman said. Yes, 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 of course, of course, absolutely, quite right, quite right, yes, I'll get that fixed, don't you leave it to me, I'll get that sorted, right? And I remember coming away from that meeting thinking, well, wait, that was a bit easy, you know, that was a bit, uh, I thought, I didn't think it would go as well as that, you know, I thought he'd be a bit, you know, like, sort of, uh, you know, obviously you shouldn't have seen this was internal advice for the minister, and obviously you shouldn't have seen it, so I do apologise that that you found out about it in this way. But, you know, obviously that is is my opinion and I'm, I've invited you here to justify it, back it up. Um, but in fact, uh, what he did was uh, basically just give us anything we wanted. And then, but what we didn't know at the time was he was about three months away from leaving office. So what happened was he ended up leaving office and uh, nothing, nothing that he promised was ever done. And that's why he promised it all. Because he must have known at the time that he was promising it, it would never be done. You know, the, the, fucking, the fucking effrontery of these people, the way they can look you straight in the eyes and lie, you know, uh, is, uh, it never fails to amaze me. So, uh, so that's what I mean about... Uh, you know, behind the scenes when you, you don't know who you're dealing with. And quite frequently in government you don't know who you're dealing with. You really don't. Um, and then the other game I was talking about was, um, well not game, but computer programming, which I don't do much these days. Um, you know, if you unless you count uh, formulas in Excel as uh, programming, which I suppose they are. Um, and that taught me that uh, and, and it's a great it's a great comfort really to a certain type of personality that with the same inputs you get the same outputs um, computers are very deterministic which means that uh, if you run the same program five times you'll get the same you'll get the same output you know same input equals the same output and, and also it taught me that the output is very much dependent on on the program so you make a slight change in the program and you might get a different output. And in a way, uh, <clears throat> what you have to do is you have to not only, you can't program by trial and error. You can't say, 
if I put these inputs in, I want these uh, this particular output. Um, well, you actually you can do that in Excel. <laughs> you can do a what's it called a what if function or something. Anyway, but the point is that uh, you you have to decide what the sausage machine is going to do to the sausage meat, uh, you, <laughs> and not only in practice but also in theory. You know, you have to you have to think. You have to be quite rigorously logical and think uh, what is going to happen when you run this program and it's it's a lot oftentimes it's not what you think not certainly not initially but you'll get more experience as a programmer you can you can write code and uh, and it will do for the most part <clears throat> more or less what you want with a bit of debugging but this is very similar to the <clears throat> principles of Jeremy Bentham who uh, founded uh, University College which is where I trained as a dentist and is the guy who used to be kept in a, when I was there in the late 70s, was was kept in a glass case in the foyer, watching the students coming in and out. Um, and he he uh, pioneered this principle of um, uh, working out or thinking through in advance what the likely consequences were going to be of your action, you know. This sort of uh, deterministic thinking, which is, you know, sort of <laughs> not not look before you leap type, you know, thinking where you you shouldn't just do something and think, oh, that that feels like a good idea or that feels like a bad idea. You know, try and think this through. Try and think. Try and forecast or uh, foretell what's actually going to happen. And computer programming has taught me that, and so it's taught me a way of. Um, deterministic thinking about the world and also that the world can be deterministic that it's not chaotic I know chaos theory exists but it exists as a as an offshoot as a, as a, as a, as a sort of a parallel way of considering certain problems like grains of sand or pencils standing on their points um, or uh, the Mandelbrot uh, series or uh, infinite patterns that never repeat and stuff like that but for the most part, the world in which we live in, you know, not, not the world of quarks and gluons, but the world of atoms and uh, uh, protons and uh, electrons, uh, is deterministic. And, um, and so all you've got to do is find the right computer program to run up here. And it will work. It will work. Once you've debugged it enough, and assuming you've got enough processing power, uh, you'll um, you'll find that the world does make sense. Hello, he's coming down the side road. Yeah, that's where the ambulance station is. Uh, that's where the ambulance station is. And just on the right here is where my surgery is. So you can see why we don't worry too much about getting a an ambulance if we need one. Not that I ever really needed one. Well, we did have one, someone in the uh, unit next to us had indigestion and we called an ambulance just in case she was having a heart attack. Uh, they said to me, do you think she's having a heart attack? And I'm like, well, what do I know? What do I know? I don't know she's not having a heart attack. And to be honest with you, I'd rather call out an ambulance for a case of indigestion then not call out an ambulance for a heart attack. So I said, she could be. Well, I was honest, you know, she could be. And I'm like, so they're all right then, so we'll blue light an ambulance. So, by which they mean, we'll ask someone to saunter over, you know, because uh, people who are having heart attacks generally screaming and crying into the phone. And I wasn't, I was very calm. And so I think they were like, oh, yeah, well, we'll, you know, <laughs> if the situation is as calm as the caller, then we've got about 30 minutes to get. <laughs> so so I did do it once, but they were here in a couple of minutes. You've got to give them credit where credit's due. Anyway, chess and computer programming, that's what I recommend to you. That's it. To be a nerd like me. Okay, it was nice to see you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>